If you're a pop culture junkie who loves TV, film, music, comedy, and other really important stuff, then you've come to the right place. Get ready and settle in for Classic Conversations, the best pop culture interviews in the world. That's right, we circled the globe so you don't have to. If you're ready to be the king of the water cooler, then you're ready for Classic Conversations with your host, Jeff Dwoskin. All right, Tracy, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. You get the show going each and every week, and this week was no exception. Welcome, everybody, to episode 250 of Classic Conversations. As always, I am your host, Jeff Duoskin. Great to have you back for what's sure to be the biggest crime-fighting focused episode in the history of Classic Conversations, second only to episode 50 when Robin the Boy Wonder was here the first time. That's right, Burt Ward is returned to the show. Burt Ward is here to talk Batman, Batman, and more Batman. If you're looking for Batman, you've come to the right place. Burt Ward has it all. And that's coming up in just a few seconds. And in these few seconds, just a quick reminder, a couple past amazing interviews, Michelle Danner, renowned acting coach and director, and of course, TV's Michael Gray, Billy Batson of Shazam. Nope, don't, don't just me. Okay, Billy Batson of Shazam. We're here. Great interviews. You're going to love them. And you know what else you're going to love? My conversation with Burt Ward. We're talking Gentle Giants dog food and products. That's his way that he and his wife, Tracy, are changing the world, rescuing dogs, doing so much good stuff. I'm a huge fan. Started to be a huge fan after we talked after episode 50. I tell him all about that. And we talk Batman. We talk the appearance in The Flash, the Batman movie, the Batman TV show, villains, everything. This episode has it all. Enjoy. All right, everyone, I'm excited to introduce my next guest, starred in one of the most iconic TV shows from the 60s. He has rescued over 15,000 dogs, way more than that at this point, with his wife, Tracy, with their gentle giant's rescue. You know him as Robin the Boy Wonder from TV's Batman, Burt Ward. Hello, citizen. Hello. How are you? I'm great, thank you. All right, Bert, since the last time we talked and we had a really awesome discussion about Gentle Giants. So after that, I just want to show you this. I, uh, boom. Oh! <laughs> I have your, not only do I have your Gentle Giants dog food and I've been, we're on a Chewy subscription. So we've been getting it ever since. My dog loves it. My wife's in love with the food as well. Cause you know how hard it is to find the right food for your dog. Oh, Absolutely. And I have friends who have big dogs. I have a little dog. I have a little Maltese, but I have friends with big dogs that I got them to do it. And not only the food, I remember when we talked last time, you were telling me about just the bowl being raised up and we changed the, but we changed everything based on that. Oh, that's great. That's well, that's going to add five years to your dog's life by elevating the food. And there's a specific height for every dog. And that height is such that when your dog comes over to eat or drink, he or she only tilts his head down, never leans down. And the reason for that is because dogs' bodies wear out much faster than human bodies. And the average dog, now you have a smaller dog, so you're going to be able to add a few extra years. But the average dog, by the time it's seven or eight years old, it starts to have a problem getting up. It starts to have a problem walking. And within three or four years, you've got a dog that can't get up anymore. And once it can't get up and it starts to poop and pee on itself, that's when people take it to a vet to be euthanized which is really tragic because mentally the dog is perfectly alert and emotionally the dog would never believe that you would take it to be put to death when it's given you a whole life of love. So how do we combat that? We combat that by understanding that because their bodies wear out so fast, you want to do everything you can to reduce the stress on your dog's body. You know, we say that every stress you can remove today from your dog's body, you can add on to the length of their life. So what is the stress? Well, think about it. If you put a bowl of food on the ground, even with this very small dog, they still lean down to get the food and they bring it up and they chew. Then they go down, lean down to get the water and it's up and down and up and down every day. And you're really wasting motion that that dog could be conserving to walk an extra month or a year or whatever. So that's one of the reasons. The other thing is digestion. Digestion is the greatest stress on a dog's body, digesting. 
So that's why we tell people, we recommend that you feed your dog five or more equally small meals, you know, in a day. Most people do every, what, twice a day. That means every 12 hours, effectively, they're without food. You know, then they get fed and of course they eat it all real quick because they're so hungry. And then they got to wait another 12 hours. You know, it's the old saying, how to eat an elephant one bite at a time. These smaller, (laughs) these smaller steps, it actually reduces the stress in the dog's body. And over time, it adds years. You know, the other thing people keep saying to me, what, why is your food so different? Let me just tell you a couple of three big things. One, any other pet food I've ever felt, dog's food, if you rub the kibbles in your fingers, you feel a slightly greasy feeling. That's because pet food companies add fat, not only on the outside of the food, but on the inside of the food. They put excessive fat. And you say, well, why would they do that? Because it confuses dogs' brains to believe that they're hungrier than they really are. So they keep eating and eating and eating. And of course, the more they eat, the more you ultimately have to buy. But coating the outside of a food with fat, which is on every food I've ever seen except ours. Yeah, I say to people, would you ever take a can of bacon grease, pour it down your garbage disposal? Well, of course not. Well, then when you realize that animal fat will ruin a metal garbage disposal, why would you ever feed a dog a food that every single kibble is encapsulated in animal fat? That shortens their life because it clogs their arteries, clogs their intestines. The second thing is GMOs. This is such a serious problem in our country for humans as well as dogs. Do you know that 98% of the food supply that we eat in the United States has been genetically modified? And you'll say, well, why did they do that? Well, because when farmers would grow a crop, whether it's fruits, vegetables, rice, something like that, pests will attack it. And in the past, when they sprayed a pesticide to kill the pest, it would also kill the plant. So they were not being able to produce and therefore they couldn't make as much money and they lived a lower quality of life. The people that make Roundup, (laughs) you know, you've heard about all the litigations over cancer causing Roundup. Those people in 1996 came out with a product called Roundup Ready Crops. And what they did is they went to farmers and they said, listen, you don't have to worry about losing your crop anymore. We're going to provide you with a new DNA of everything that you make. And so when you go, for example, to grow rice and pests attack it, to spray our Roundup on that plant, it will kill the pest, but it won't kill the rice plant. It will grow and you'll get your full crop and you'll make all your money. Well, of course, everybody jumped at that because what a great business deal. What they, a lot of people didn't take into consideration is that when you spray that plant with any kind of a herbicide or pesticide, the plant absorbs it. And animals, their immune systems, your dog's immune system is much more frail than a human. And what's happening is it's causing cancer in dogs. People say, well, did you discover the fountain of youth? No, no, I didn't discover. I'll be drinking it myself. We're just not prematurely killing dogs. And the cancer-causing ingredients in pesticides causes the cancer and the dogs are dying left and right. So that's the second thing. And the third thing is companies that are in the business to make money would love it for your dog, every bite your dog took to come out the other end (laughs) so that your dog would have to keep eating and eating and eating to get the minimum nutrition. We don't believe in that. We believe just the opposite. We want your dog to get the maximum nutrition with the least amount of volume. So how do we do that? There's something called chelated minerals. It's spelled C-H-E-L-A-T-E-D, but pronounced chelated. That what they are are minerals that when you add it to the food, it helps the dog digest more. So again, it's not how much a dog eats its count, it's how much the dog's body absorbs what it eats. And that's why when people feed our food, the stool coming out of their dog is cut by a third. People can't believe it. And in the case of people that feed our cat food, we just found out from talking to a scientist, why is it that cats eating Gentle Giant's cat and kitten food don't get fur balls? Why? Why are the hair balls? No hair balls. And it's because added fat in other foods causes cats to lick themselves more. And the more they lick, they excessively lick the fur, they accumulate the hair. And then of course it creates a hairball. These are things that if you try to do things, we believe for the right reasons, you're going to get the best results. And of course, this is our charity. We don't take any salary from this. This is all about helping animals live longer. And thank goodness. In fact, I got to tell you, since we last talked, we thought we really had dogs living long and with our dogs living up to 27 and a half years. And we were recently contacted by a man who lives in Phoenix. His dog 
got it from a shelter. The puppy was six weeks old when he adopted. This dog now is 29 and a half years old. And January 3rd of next year will be 30 years old, has been eating our food for more than 15 years. We went and videotaped him, and we're going to put out a commercial with him. It was just an amazing story, and he loves his dog so much. I mean, just think, he got it at six weeks, and he's had it for 29 and a half years. Pretty cool. That's amazing. All right, so you got cats, so you should kind of come up with a version for humans. I could use less for balls as well. <laughs> Everybody says that, Jeff. But here, let me tell you what prompted us to make the cat food, because you're right. We've had a lot more than 15,500 dogs that we've rescued in 30 years. We just stopped counting five years ago. You know, I mean, too much to try to keep track. But here's the interesting thing. We've rescued probably somewhere between three to 400 cats, or maybe even a little bit more. But what prompted us to make the cat food is that two years ago, we lost two of our cats. One was 31 years old. The other was 32 years old. Wow. And guess what they were eating? They were eating the dog food. So we do know that cats need a little bit more protein, a few other very minor stuff, but they do need other stuff. So we went back to the same amazing nutritionist, the best that we could find in the country and said, all right, let's take something we know they love. And obviously, if you can live 31 and 32 years, that is so incredible. And now let's technically make a cat food that is 100% perfect. And that's what we did. We've done that. And you know, again, it's our charity. And now we're even looking at making horse food. My horse is 33 years old. And let me tell you, horses don't usually get over 30 years old. We had two other horses in the past. One lived to 36 and one lived to 37. And we did the same thing. Instead of feeding them twice a day, fed them five times a day, elevated, all to reduce the physical stress in their body. But anyway, this has been our charity. And I think I told you even before we started today that Tracy and I now are, are going to be uh, doing programming, television and film programming. We have a beautiful animation studio for 3D animation, recording studio, and we've just finished building the shell of our Sound stage that we're going to be able to film on. So we're keeping incredibly busy and having fun at the same time. It's a great story what you and Tracy did together and this charity. And you should, I mean, it'd be okay if you took a few bucks from it, Bert. No one would, no one would. <laughs> no, I, can I take something? Because there's so many people out there, especially elderly people that maybe they have a spouse, maybe they've lost their spouse, but they might have that pet. And that pet is everything in their life. And they may have very limited funds living either on Social Security or maybe a pension or whatever. You know, obviously, with the economy the way it is, the cost of food and everything else so high, we just want to be able to bring the finest food in the world as affordable as possible to help people save money so they can have their animal live with them longer. Well, it's amazing stuff. It's, uh, it's really great. Not everyone uh, dedicates themselves to such a righteous cause as you have. So. It's amazing, Bert. Really is, and I and I can attest to it personally. I my dog loves it, and we're excited to be uh, part of the Gentle Giants family. That's right, and Batman family. That's right. I don't know if you know this, but we get people. We're national now. We have probably have more than a half a million dogs that eat Gentle Giants every day, and we get just from people calling with a question about this or that, or maybe how to feed this or how often to do that. We get about eleven. 100 people a week that contact us. Now, they're not all phone calls. We'd never be able to answer that many phone calls. And Tracy helps me answer that because there's no way. It's, it's funny. I tell people I start out sounding great in the morning. By the end of the day, I'm down to a whisper. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you just can only take so much. But she helps so much with this. And people love it that you'll actually take the time to help them. And, you know, that's one of the, it's very frustrating in this world. When you have an animal and you love your animal and you want to do the best for that, but your vet can give medical advice, but not necessarily everyday advice on caring and, and things like that. And, and people say, well, where did you learn all this? I said, well, <laughs> we've had 15,000 more than that live in our house in the last 30 years, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for 30 years. I said, don't you think somebody would learn an awful lot just surviving that? We always have about 50 in our house and we feed 600 pounds a day of gentle giants. So we have a 30 pound bag and we feed 20 of those bags every day. And if you say to yourself, wait a minute, what does it take to lift, carry and pour 20 30 pound bags a day and clean up from what comes out of that 30, 
feeding. I mean, we're going to professional pooper scoopers by the time we're done. <laughs> That's right. Oh, you should have a bat scooper. That'd be a good uh, accessory. There you so. go. Yeah, I think it's going to be more like a one of those caterpillar uh, tractors, <laughs> you know, with the... <laughs> be able to lift all of that. But really in our animals, they all live together. And and in fact, you know, here we are and you don't hear anything. And I got 50 dogs in my house because we've trained them not to bark unless they sense danger. Believe it or not, barking is the beginning of aggressive behavior in animals. And you really want to avoid it. Now, if something is really bad or I mean, real danger, that's different. But if not, there's no reason to get them excited and where they bark and get upset with each other. So Our dogs live very quietly with us. It's a very nurturing environment. And that's a very important thing. If you have an animal, you want to create peace and quiet. And one of the things that people say to me all the time, well, I'm so worried about my dog, about this or that. Both Tracy, my wife, and I explain to them, cats and dogs are much more sensitive to things than you might imagine. We tell people, if you're worried about your pet, okay, that's fine to be concerned about him but never show that worry in front of them. There's been all this testing done showing that if you're stressed about something for your dog or cat, your dog or cat's going to pick up on it. Now, they don't think like we do. They think in absolutes. So when a dog sees that you're worried about something, they don't know that maybe you're worried about, you know, your car having not starting properly in the morning. They take it as though your life is in danger. And then they get stressed because they know that without you, they can't survive. So we tell everybody, whatever you do, you want to be stressed, just never show it in front of your dog or cat. Always tell them everything is fine because we don't want them to be stressed. That's going to shorten their life. I know exactly what you're saying. My mother-in-law thinks in only absolutes. So <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've, I've run out of hiding places here, but in any event, <laughs> you know, I, no, I fully un- understand exactly what you're saying. Sorry to interrupt my conversation with Burt Ward, canine crusader. Gentle Giants really is amazing. I love it. But I do need to take a quick break. First, I want to thank all of you for your support of the sponsors. When you support the sponsors, you're supporting us here at Classic Conversations. And that's how we keep the lights on. And now back to my conversation with Robin the Boy Wonder, Burt Ward. We're going all in on Batman. Enjoy. All right. Should we talk a little Batman? Absolutely. Before we dive back in time, I haven't seen it yet, but The Flash apparently has Adam West CGI in it. Here's what I know. My agent came to me. Warner Brothers requested a clip from our series. So, and I haven't seen the movie yet either. They came to me and we agreed to allow them to use a clip from the TV series. I don't know. There may be something else in addition to that. But I know that we authorized the clip to be used. And I guess they, there's a lot of cameos that they they popped in there. Yeah, I was just I was just curious. Sounds like a great movie too. You know, I mean, it, I've been seeing the advertising for it. It looks like it's uh, really uh, they've taken it to the nth degree. Yes, it looks it looks pretty good. I was digging around for some stories, so I found one thing that said you were giving a speech at Harvard University. You brought the Robin costume, and it got stolen. Right. That's true. And uh, <laughs> and uh, the person that stole it is a very popular comedian that's had his late night show on. Conan O'Brien. There you go. He was going to Harvard as a student. I'll never forget it. I was doing a thing and he came up on the stage with another guy. And they said, you know, we're here from, you know, security and we just want to make sure there's no issue. So we're going to take your costume backstage till you're finished. And then we, we'll, of course give it back to you. And then, of course, he used that to steal it. And uh, now that was a really valuable costume, by the way. <laughs> that was not, that, that you're talking about something that well, one of a kind, you know, I can only only imagine the monetary value, but it took a day and a half to get it back. But we finally got it back. I was on his show some years ago. He remembered very well. In fact, he brought it up. It was funny. So it, it's so funny how, you know, your paths can cross at different times in different places. It's a really funny story. So what was that your costume or you just were? Oh, position? yes. Yeah. Well, let me tell you what happened on Batman. These fight scenes, they had six costumes for me. But every one of these fight scenes, something got torn or pulled or frayed or whatever. And because of personal appearances that I would make on the weekends, I made my own costume. You know, it was an exact duplicate, if anything, nicer. And and it got to be where if there was a problem where the, I had to do a scene where there was a close up. 
and all of the collars were frayed on the on the because of the fights. I would use my own costume because I, I didn't do anything with you know. I wanted to keep it pristine, and it worked great. I did have my own costume, so that was the costume that I was taking was shown. But I mean, we would go through. I mean, they had like every week like six Robin costumes. Those fight scenes, you could go through two or three costumes in one fight scene. You know, oh, stop it. You know, this tour, well, we don't have time to fix it. Put on a new cape, put on a new vest. Oh, you get shredded tights, go get this. I mean, you know, just so many things. Your mask get torn off and because it actually tore from the fight scene where it was pulled off the face portion. You know, I, so things happen when you're doing very active stuff. And Batman was a very physical show. Oh, yeah. Pow, zow. I, I know. <laughs> oh, yeah, but I mean, there, these fight scenes got really rough because these stunt guys, they like that stuff. And normally when you have a fight scene, it doesn't go on as long. Ours were like, these stunt guys that were hired to do stunt work for us really spent 90% of their time choreographing these two and three minute fight scenes, which that's a long time. And, you know, th- all kinds of things like somebody picks up a table and crashes it over Batman's head. And of course, he falls down, but then gets right up. I mean, the one thing that was great is that we could have all that action and yet it'd be family oriented. Nobody ever really got hurt. Anytime something happened, they got knocked down, they got right back up, no blood. I mean, it was really something, the whole family. And I think one of the reasons Batman was so successful is that here you go back in 1960s, color television had just come out. Very few people had a color television. But there were some, and they were starting to sell them pretty good. And our costumes, oh my gosh, look at the brightness of our costumes. Look at the villains' costumes. Amazing colors and stuff like that. At the time our show came out, people, it's like the typical family in America. Dad was at work. Maybe the mom also worked, possibly, but a lot of times just stayed home, took care of uh, of the house and stuff. Kids were at school. So by the end of the day everybody got together, they had their dinner together, and what do they do as a family right after dinner? They go in their living room and they sit down and turn on the television. And guess what? There we were. I mean, that's why we reached so many millions and millions and millions of people and all ages. There was something for everybody. For kids, it was the hero worship. For the adults, it was the nostalgia of the comic book. But for the college kids and the high school kids, That was a really tough audience to reach because at that time, nobody that age wanted to be inside watching television. They want to be out cruising around the local outdoor restaurant on a Friday and Saturday night, revving their engines and stuff like that. So how did we get them in? Well, we got them in by the campy style, the suggestive, often double meaning stuff that we said, the extremely overly uh, reverent attitude that, I mean, for example, I can't tell you how many teenagers and college kids, they would think it's the funniest thing in the world when I'd have a line with Batman or Bruce Wayne at the time and say, gosh, Bruce, you're right. I mean, nobody at that age ever would tell the parents that they were right. You would be rather be torn apart than to, to say something like admit to your parents that they were right. Oh, no, it's you're that right. The parents are wrong. That was the time. And yet in the dorms, these college kids would get there an hour and a half early to get a seat just to wait on Tuesday and Thursday nights for Batman to come on. And the high schoolers, the same thing. So we had this giant audience. We were number one and number two in the entire world, Jeff. I mean, pretty amazing. And our opening night ratings were higher than any Super Bowl ratings ever. We had a 55 share on the opening night of January 12th, 1966, which meant in North America, because the ratings cover all of North America, you got besides the United States, Mexico, and Canada, that 55% of every television that were turned on were watching Batman that night. 55%. And all the other local stations, uh, regional stations, the two broadcast networks, plus the ones in the other countries, they were sharing that other 45%. It was it was gigantic. It was so crazy because you'd have people, I mean, women had their Batman hairdos. Kids had their Batman and Robin underoos. I mean, <laughs> there was, you know, I mean, I can't tell you how many hundreds of thousands of letters of people sending in a photo of their child dressed up with a bath towel uh, around their neck held together with a clothespin 
jumping off their couch wanting to be Batman and Robin. It was phenomenal. Oh yeah, I was I was right there. So the the interesting thing about how huge it was, and it had, like you said, one of the biggest debuts ever, was that they were thoroughly convinced based on the screening, the the tests that they did before, that it was gonna be a complete failure because the pilot tested worse than anything's ever tested. Like it just tanked. I'll, I'll tell you why. I believe, you see, we change things. I can tell you as a fact, in those days, when people watch television, it's usually you're watching a, like a police show where there's the good guys and the bad guys. And you as an audience person is really, you're totally away from it. You're just watching something in the distance and you're not really part of it. You don't feel, you don't feel reacting to it. And so it was either a police show or a medical show where somebody's sick and somebody's trying to save their life. It was not drawing people in. And what Adam and I made a conscious effort to reach through that television set and affect the people in the audience to draw them in. And I think in that screening that people were not prepared for that. You know, sometimes when you give something to somebody that is so new and so different, they don't really know how to react to it. And sometimes they actually think negative only because, well, I've never seen anything like that. That that doesn't, you can't do that on television. And yet we did and became so gigantic for it. It's strange things that you never know, right? I mean, you, you never know. We were a mid-season replacement. Came in, and in fact, you know, I, I may have told you last time we talked that it was right during our first hiatus that this young producer came to me at Fox and said, I want you to be in my movie. And I said, yeah. And I asked Fox. They said, yeah, you can be in it. And I they said, as long as you don't have it done with another studio, you know, because they you know, they're all protective about that. But then ABC came back in and said, uh, no, nah, we don't want you to do anything else. Batman and Bewitched made ABC, which was a syndicated network, a real, the number three broadcast network, the power of our show. They didn't want me to do anything. So I didn't get that movie. It was called The Graduate with Dustin Hoffman. They got him to play the role. They couldn't get me. And of course, you know, it became a monster hit. I would have, I would have loved to do that. And it was so funny because the producer, his name is Larry Terman. Every so often in in town where you go out, a lot of people go to the same restaurant. So, and I'd run into him. He'd say, "Oh, Bert, I always run at you for that role." I said, "Please, Larry, don't, don't, <laughs> don't rub it in." I would have loved to have done it. Oh. But, you know, so you win some and you lose some, Jeff. Right? And and people say, "Oh, does that really bother you?" What about typecasting? I said, look at it. Look at it this way. If you have success. Think of it like a, a glass full of water. You can have a glass full of water that represents a whole bunch of smaller successes, or you can have a glass full of water, one giant success and other smaller success. Either way, it's your glass is full. And that's the way I've always looked at it, that I was incredibly fortunate, had a great time doing this. And it is truly a classic. Our show, when they took Batman and put it into reruns, normally a show, when it sells into reruns, these other networks buy it for a year, you know, these cable stations. Do you know that Batman was sold initially because of the success? If you were a station, you wanted to carry Batman, you had to buy it for 25 years. 25 years? That's amazing. I mean, not one year. And that's how big, and they got it. And our show has been aired. It's still on every week here in the U.S., different cable channels and stuff. But it really, truly a classic. And it was so much fun. And the adults today are were the kids of the past. And a lot of them bring their kids up. They say, you know, we love Batman. It was very wholesome. It wasn't dark. It wasn't deadly and violent and stuff like that. And, you know, we want our kids to grow up in a in a very positive atmosphere. I love your attitude on it because, you know, it's you'll meet some people that don't embrace oh, exactly. what they got. And not everyone has something on their resume. Somebody might have a thousand things on their resume and don't have Robin. You know what I mean? Like, right. <laughs> right. Just to be part of something so iconic. And I think why you're just so loved and, and Adam was so loved was how much you guys embraced it and loved the fans. Oh, absolutely. And Adam and I got along so well. Let me tell you something. There really is something to having a chemistry when people are working together, you know, as a team. He and I got along so well. When I met him, I met him at my screen test. And I went for the screen test. They said, oh, we're going to have you read with another actor. And I said, okay. And they said, here, Bert, this is Adam. And, and, and oh, hi, how are you? And he said, yeah, I'm Adam West. Oh, I'm Bert Ward. We sat down. In five minutes, the two of us were laughing. 
we got along like you just wouldn't believe. And we never stopped laughing for over 50 years. We just got along so well. And I must tell you, I really believe the chemistry that we had on screen, which was natural. Directors often tell actors how to say their lines. Oh, well, can you say this with more emotion? Or can you be more upset about this? Or can you do this? Can you do that? Do you know, in 120 episodes and 32 different directors, not one director ever told Adam or me how to say a line. Not once. Not once in 120 episodes. Because I truly played off the way he would say things. You know, Adam was such a funny guy. I mean, such a naturally funny human being. And he loved to think of himself kind of like Winston Churchill. Or, I mean, you know, he thought it was such grandness. He once came to me and said, you know, Bert, you know, that deep voice. He, you know, I finally realized what it's like to play Batman. I said, well, what do you mean, Adam? Well, you know, I watched last night a movie. I watched The Ten Commandments. Okay. And I watched Moses come down from the Sermon on the Mount with the word of God. And Adam, oh my God, Adam, please don't go there. You know what I mean? And he's, he, you know, he, he was so, you know, oh my gosh. I mean, he, he saw himself in such a grand way. And, and it was so funny because the, the slower he would talk, the faster I would talk. I counterpointed everything and people just went crazy over that. Because if you look at the great comic duos in history, they've always been a great contrast. Like Laurel and Hardy, right? One skinny and one heavy. I mean, even Johnny Carson and McMahon did a different way of presenting things. Uh, Abbott and Costello. I mean, the great, great comedy duos in history have always had extreme things between them. So as, as slow as Adam would talk, I would talk that much faster, you know, and he'd be like, calm down now, Robin. And it's like, people just ate it up. And it's so funny when people come to our events, They'd stand in line for sometimes five hours to get a signature. And when they get up there, they'd start doing our lines in front of us. You know, I mean, they went, <laughs> they'd say, oh, I know you're going to say this. Gosh, golly gee, Batman. It's hilarious. And Adam and I used to laugh so much. But Adam was quite a character. And he would say things to people. Let me tell you something very eye opening. Uh, I remember one time when we had these uh, very very attractive young ladies come up on the stage and he uh, said to one of them, he's in a costume, of course, and it's cowl. He said, oh, I've got an itch in my cowl. Would you mind scratching my ear? And, and, and so the, the young lady go, just scratches his ear and go, oh, I feel so much better. He says, and having met you, I'm beginning to feel strange stirrings in my utility belt. You know, <laughs> the kinds of things that is so weird. And so, so and oh my gosh, People would just be embarrassed. He could embarrass people like nothing you've ever seen. And he and I just had the best time. He was like a true funny person. He didn't have to get up on a stage and say a bunch of swear words to get people to laugh. Just the way his mind worked, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> was like, oh, I don't know about this. He's a pretty kooky guy. <laughs> oh, it's so funny. I'd love to hear about some of your other castmates as well, like Alan Napier. Oh, he was the nicest man. Oh, he, you know, played our butler, Alfred. And he was, I mean, he was perfect for the role, okay? And by the way, he had his pet dog. His pet dog was so small, the entire dog's body fit into the palm of his hand. And he's a very big man. He's six foot nine and a half, I think. Really, really tall. Adam was six foot four. Julie Newmar was six foot three, and they put four inch heels on her and four inch heels on Adam. And they cut my heels off so I'd be smaller. And then when I would go out and make appearances, they say, gosh, I had no idea you were this big. I I thought you're little, you know? Well, in comparison to to what they made at, you know, Batman and Catwoman look like, I look tiny in comparison. Yeah. Oh, what a wonderful, sweet, kind, everything truly British. He was the perfect. You couldn't have a better butler than him. Now, on the other hand, Julie Newmar, if you want to talk about cast members, she's the only person that Adam was cautious around, okay? Because she also had a very brilliant mind, She and she does, you know, but she could come out with zingers too. That, that, 
<laughs> and Adam would never know what she was about to say. You, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. I mean, she she was as un, as unpredictable and could say things you just you just say nobody could guess get away with saying that. Oh my gosh, right? She was wonderful. In fact, I, I remember there was a great scene on Batman. It was it, it, such. This is so Batman style, you know, the campy style where she's Catwoman, and there's a, a moment of kind of mental chemistry between her and Batman. And she says, oh, Batman, why don't you and I get married? We could do such wonderful things together. And Batman kind of thinks for a minute. He said, well, what would we do with Robin? She said, oh, kill him. You know, oh, he's no, we're not going to kill Robin. You know, I, it was just that, <laughs> that kind of, I mean, it just was that everything was so funny. And there were other scenes where we'd be chasing villains on the street, you know, running down, always running, always chasing the bad guy, right? So you'd see these villains run across the street, and I'd start to run across the street, and Batman would say, no, Robin, we have to follow the law. We must use the crosswalk. I said, oh, but Batman, you know, we're going to get way behind him. So we have to go to the crosswalk, go to cross the, then we can continue running after. Oh, my gosh. And people giggled and giggled. And they, they just, people just love that. It was that, and that style of Batman that kind of, you know, we say things and, and, and we did it in such a, he did it. Adam was so amazing. He, everything he said was in a suggestive way that you can take any number of ways. And I mean, and of course, you know, he had some wild moments. There was a time in the Batcave where we had Batgirl. This is the third season. We had shown her the Batcave, and now it was time to take her back out of the Batcave. We couldn't let her know where, you know, where the Batcave was. So we were going to drive her in the Batmobile. We had to give her a whiff of bat gas, kind of, you know, like to knock her out. So when we got outside, we could return and she wouldn't know where the Batcave is. So we have this scene, and it's supposed to be a really quick scene where she's already kind of like out. And I'm in the passenger side of the Batmobile. Of course, Adam as Batman is in the driver's seat. And I have a line like, gosh, Batman, Batgirl is very pretty. And Batman's supposed to have a line like, well, Robin, I'm glad you noticed. It shows you're growing up or something like something trivial. And then we start the car and drive off. Well, Adam messed up 11 takes in a row. Over that one sentence, 11 takes in a row. And now you have to understand there's so much pressure on a director when you're shooting series television, you can't fall behind. I mean, you can never work again as a director if you get behind and the studio loses money. So the director was starting to really panic. Adam, what's the matter? What's, you keep getting, he says, well, I'll, I'll, I'll make, let's do it again. So we're on the 12th take. The 12th take, you have to understand, you just don't turn it right back on. You got to get, I'll make sure the lights are right, film is right, and they haven't run to the end. All of this stuff before you can start. So here we go in the 12th take. And I say, gosh, Batman, you know, Batgirl is very pretty. And Adam, who intentionally had done this all the time, he says, well, I'm glad you noticed, Robin. It shows the oncoming thrust of manhood. (laughs) And and so I, like, had tears coming down my mask on the inside. I was laughing so hard, but trying to keep a straight face. Rector, nobody caught it. Nobody caught it. And that's exactly what Adam wanted. So here now, a few weeks go by. They edit it. There's no other cut. They have to use it. It's on the show. They air it. And boy, the censors came in. And you can't say this. Producer saying to Adam, why did you? And I, listen, you know, it was frustrating. It was the 12th take. I, I, I just said whatever you know, ever came to my mind kind of thing. But that was the beginning of when the censors started coming in on us for all kinds of suggested things. Well, you can't do that. You can't do this on national television. Now, today, it's a whole different world, but it wasn't in the 60s. Keeping in that thread. So you fought the Joker, the Riddler, Catwoman, Penguin, but one of your personal other villains, (laughs) if you will, uh, the Catholic League of Decency. That's right. (laughs) Oh, you have to understand, everybody wanted to have their say about that. Everybody wanted to have their take. Psychiatrists that got into this whole thing about, well, you know, Batman and Robin is really, really the wish dream of two homosexuals. They would ask me about this, you know, for questions about this news article or something like that. And I would say, hey, I don't understand what's so strange about two guys wearing tights and run around fighting crime. And, and of course, they laugh, oh, wow, you know. But yes, and, and in this case, it was they didn't like the way I fit, fit in my leotards. I mean, man, I've got to be honest with you, Jeff, man was not built for tights. Okay, we let's get that right out in the open here. So as a result, and they're very clean, 
And they thought it was that you shouldn't have a bulge like that. You know what I mean? I mean, just normal is not anything other than normal, but you're wearing a very clinging material. So we had these uh, wardrobe guys and some of them were like, oh, I want you to try this on and try that on. Oh, my God, these exotic things they were trying to give me. And none of it worked. And finally, finally, they found this doctor that gave me these pills that would shrink you up for like two or three days. I took him for one or twice, I remember. And then I got worried. What if, what if it ruins my, you know, never able to have a child or something? So I stopped taking him and I started using my cape to cover. But the word got out and we were, te- oh, I was teased on the set. You have no idea. We had this Londinium Larson, these three-parter where Lord Fogg and Lady Pea Soup and Glennis Johns, and instead of having the guys as henchmen, had all these very attractive English young ladies as their hench women or whatever. And <laughs> oh, they all knew about this stuff. So in the course of, and they're supposed to be grabbing, pulling me, and, and I'm, you know, I can't hit them because they're, you know, we've never hit a lady, you know, so you could hit them. But in the course of their pulling me and tugging me, they're continuously, purposely, running into me, rubbing against me, doing everything they could to aggravate the situation. They wanted a piece of the boy wonder, right? Oh, God, they're trying to get a rise out of me, I guess. All I, all I can tell you was that these are crazy things that went on. And, and it's like, oh, my gosh, in the scheme of things, what's the big deal about this? And, but everybody had to have their two cents in about our show. It was number one in the entire world. I mean, it really... And my gosh, the women with the Batman hairdos, oh, you just, these amazing hairdos. I can't imagine they must spend hours in a beauty shop to get a Batman style hairdo and every conceivable toy and metal Batmobile and, and, oh, there's everything. The the studio went nuts and the the company that Warner Bros. that owned the rights took out an ad that after the first year of Batman that they sold, this is back in 1966, $1.2 billion of Batman merchandise. $1.2 billion. In those days, that's like $12 billion now. And it actually turned out in history with all these other shows, wonderful shows, you know, Star Wars movies, Star Wars and Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter and Superman, all of these other merchandise, all the Avengers, all of that stuff. Batman merchandise is still the greatest selling merchandise in history. It still is number one, the Batman merchandise. Since you were um, one degree away from everything, costume aside, what's one thing that you have or wish you had from the show? Oh, it's like a memento from the show. (sighs) I got it. I had a battering. Okay. I did have a battering and that was really cool. Now, you, Robin had different batarangs than Batman. I don't know if you know that. I had a batarang. That was really cool. And I almost got a Batmobile. I almost got a Batmobile. But you got a lot of upkeep with a Batmobile. Unless you're driving it, you have to have, have it, uh, you know, on a special trailer. To take it because of the width of the Batmobile so wide. On the trailers that hold a Batmobile, in order to be able to drive on a, on a highway, you only have four inches of space on either side of the car. That is way too close to, you know, I mean, you could have where you could rub this paint job off or something. Oh, so I guess I, and I had my own costume. So I think the Batman's battering that I got was, was really cool. And I heard later on that Industrial Light Magic got the mold. And they actually sent me one that they made from that mold, which I thanked them so much. It was a real, a real treasure. So I actually had, I had two bat- batarangs. That's pretty awesome. You mentioned the Batmobile. I'm a big fan of George Barris's work, who designed the the Batmobile and the Munster Coach, and oh, absolutely, a lot of famous, famous things. The Joker Mobile. Did you see the Joker Mobile? Of course. How do you miss <laughs> so much iconic stuff? But what was interesting that I read was that it almost wasn't a George Barris. It was almost a G, almost a Dean Jeffries because he had to pass on it because originally they were going to make the Batman movie. And then they rushed the TV show into production, right? Uh, Dean Jeffries couldn't do it. George Barris ended up getting it in the speed and time to market. George Barris was really good at creating a lot of these iconic things fast. If you read about any of those, it was like, he had uh, two weeks. But this was like a 1955 Lincoln that actually had already been in another movie. It started with a kiss with Glenn Ford and Debbie Reynolds, painted differently, Uh of course. I just thought that was interesting. And they converted that into the Batmobile, made that the Batmobile. 
Yeah, oh, yeah, that's true. And of course, very nice man, George Barris. Very nice man. He wasn't too happy with me on the first episode, though. In fact, he was really upset with me because one of the scenes that I had, you have to understand, I loved doing that so much that when I got into it, I did what the character would do. I didn't really, it's not thinking about like acting, acting. You know, I, I, when I grew up, I always wanted to be a superhero. And after school, I would come home and, and I, I had this wall and I had a ball and I would kick this ball against the wall and chase it and kick it and keep doing this while I'm daydreaming about being a superhero, right? And so when I got the role and I'm doing this stuff, I just did what I thought the character would do. I mean, and, and I just became absorbed in it. So one of the first things that we did with Robert Butler, the, the director who directed the pilot, which was very special because instead of a one-week schedule, they gave it a six-week pilot. I mean, they really made a big deal out of really making a perfect episode, a pilot episode. But anyway, what we did with the, with the Batmobile is we pulled up to a museum and the way Batman parked the Batmobile is the car was actually facing away from the museum, and we were supposed to get out of the car and then run to the back of the car, continue over to the museum wall. That's where we climb up the side of the building. This was the Riddler show. The director thought that I would just open the door and come out. So they set up for that. There was never any talk about that. Okay, you guys are going to come out and you go to the back. Go over there to where the museum wall and you're going to throw your battering up and that stuff. When it came to shooting it, I just thought, hey, I've got to go in the back. So instead of opening the door, I just stood up on the seat, stood up on top of the door, walked on that very careful, very narrow fin all the way to the back and jumped off the back, right? And the director <laughs> says, cut, cut, Bert, we didn't set up for that. We thought you got coming out the door. You're supposed to come out. That's supposed to climb and go to the back. I said, okay, I'll do it. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. He says, that was so natural. That was so unexpected and so real looking. All right, we're going to take another half hour to set up. Go get the tracks, get the plywood. They put down this thing so they can dolly and they dolly and they made the shot. And I got such a great response from the producer. Oh my gosh. Where did you get that idea, Bert? Did Bob Butler tell? No, no, he didn't tell me to do that. It just did. It was such a nice thing. But here they weren't expecting. To, however, here's the part about George Barris. He saw me standing on his 30 coat paint job, right? And walking on that very, almost coming to a point on the fin, which easily could have nicked it or scratched it or dented it. But I had, I had rubber soles on my boots, right? And they, I understood. I didn't know it. But they had two crewmen plus the assistant director holding George Barris and his two employees back from rushing to the Batmobile to get me off of it. You know, there's almost a fight behind the, on the set because, oh, you can't touch my Batmobile. You can't do that. And I didn't know about it until later. They kept it away. But later on, George and I kind of worked things out together. It was very nice. You, you know, he was a really nice man. And thereafter, we always got together. I said, look, I just, I was motivated to do it. This is the real thing. I'm doing what Robin would do. And he said, yeah, I understand that, but my paint job. And I said, well, look, you know, it's look okay. Is there any paint? No, no, but it could have gone wrong. And they fret about that because the studio, you have one, they had to have three Batmobiles at all times. If one thing went wrong or maybe it didn't start or who knows what the pro they have to have a replacement. And they had two replacements on set. So he had to make three Batmobiles. That's incredible. Sorry to interrupt. Have to take a quick break. And we're back with Burt Ward to talk about all the dangerous stunts he was a part of on the set. And we're back. I thought you were going to tell the story how on the first day of shooting, they tried to pretty much kill you a million times. <laughs> oh, no, they just waited. They just did a little bit each day. <laughs> Every day there was something else I was in the hospital for. And, of course, by the end, and then they took out that huge multi, multi-million dollar life insurance policy. And I swear, by the end of the third season, I thought they were trying to collect on that policy. They gave me some really dangerous stuff to do. I mean, I don't know if I told you the story where I had a scene. And, and here's the thing. I always would say, well, wait a minute. Why don't you use my stuntman? Oh, we can't use him. Why can't you use him? He doesn't look like you. Well, why didn't you hire somebody who was a stuntman that looked close enough to me? So that I wouldn't have to do all these by myself. Well, we can't find anybody, Bert. So you got to do it. So there was this scene on top of a sound stage, Jeff. Do you realize how tall those sound stages? I had to go up on top of the sound stage. All right. And the way you, how you get up there, you have these rickety old wooden steps where you can see through the step. Every step you get higher 
and you kind of crink. It makes a little crackling sound as you step on the wood going up and up and the next layer and you go higher and way up. And the thing is like 80 or 90 feet tall. It's huge soundstage. And the scene was that I was going to be hung over upside down off the soundstage. And I said, I don't want to do that. Oh, that's what's in the show. The writer will get a different writer. No, can't do that. It's in the show. So here it is lunchtime, right? But if they're doing this right after lunch and right after lunch, I'm up there and I say, wait a minute. Only way I'm going to do this is if I get a, you get me a big rope, you know, like one of those that tie a boat to a mooring and let me tie it around something that I see is strong and tie it around my leg. And they say, what? We got two of our strongest stunt guys holding you. I said, yeah. And we had fried chicken for lunch. Don't you think their fingers might be a little greasy? They might slip and drop me upside down off the soundstage to my death. No way. I'm doing this with this tight around my leg. And that's the only way I would do that shot. And it came out okay, but it was, I, w- I can't believe I did that. The only thing that was even more dangerous is I had to go up the same rickety steps. You know when we slid down the bat pole? Well, most of the time we were in Wayne Manor where they had a, it was about an eight foot drop below level where we jump onto the bat pole and slide down. But there was a time for the movie that they wanted to go all the way down to simulate how high it was. They built it all the way up, right up near the top of the soundstage, a pole, okay, for Adam, one for me. And you had to go up the riggedy steps and along the highest catwalk. Now, they have multiple levels of catwalk. This was the highest catwalk. To get to this, they had no net under me. They had nothing. And I had the stunt guys tell me, okay, well, when you do this, Bert, you have to understand you're going to be sliding down. Even though you got gloves and boots on, the friction is going to be tremendous. So what you have to do is you have to, as you're sliding down, you're like slightly letting go, which will go down a little faster, but then you're clinging with your gloves because it's going to burn a hole right through your gloves. It's on and off, on and off. And same thing with your feet, you know, the insides of your soles against the thing because it just burn up the sole. You're going like 80 or 90 feet sliding down with no net. What if I missed? Can't believe I did it. Adam and I did it. We were so stupid. We could have died right then. And I still never know why they didn't have a net. Why didn't they have something? They just figured, okay, you're just going to jump out on the pole. It's right there. Yeah, but what if you didn't get it? Do it right. Oh, my gosh. And see, those are the kinds of things that I wake up and have dreams about. One and, oh, my gosh. Thank God I survived that. Thank God. I mean, it sounds like, yeah, it's, <laughs> it sounds like it was a very, very dangerous environment. I imagine if you're doing it these days, things would be a lot differently. I imagine I the so. uh, back climbing up the uh <laughs> Oh, up going the up the side of the building. That wasn't as dangerous. No, but actually it's kind of interesting because it wasn't flat. People always thought, oh, that you just turn the camera on its side. No, actually it was at a 45 degree angle. So you did have some stress on your muscles. It made it look much more realistic. And then they had clear monofilament fish line attached to our capes so they could pull them taut. Because if you were truly going straight up and down, your cape would be hanging. These guys at the studio, they are really good at this stuff. They made this absolutely wonderful. Now there was, the, my stuntman did do one thing really in our Batman movie in Century City, one of those like 30 story buildings. He did come down. He used that the thing that where they come down on the outside of the building with, uh, I mean, he and the other stuntman did that. Thank God I didn't do that. But you, it was such a wide shot that you couldn't tell there was my face or anything. You know, he they really did. And then there was the one out over the ocean in the movie where I'm flying the Batcopter and I'm lowering Batman onto this boat. And it took, turns out that the, the boat was actually just a projection, a film projection. He actually went into the water from the rope ladder of the helicopter and he comes out with a big shark on his leg, right? And, and he's beating the shark with his fist, hitting the shark. Right. And I and I got to get out of the helicopter and go down and hang upside down and having the anti shark off bat spray. Now, that's another one that my stuntman really, you know, Victor Paul was his name. He really did it. And they're out on a helicopter up over the ocean. And he went down that rope ladder and hung upside down. And then they cut to me on the stage. We're still you're hanging upside down about 10 feet off the ground, but not whatever, 80 or 100 feet above the ocean. There was a lot of stunts in that show, a lot of stuff that where Adam's stuntman and, and my stuntman, they did some stuff that was really would have been life threatening, dangerous. I was going to ask you about that shark, because that's that's sort of an iconic moment from that movie. Oh, absolutely. It's so funny. And then um, 
uh, the porpoise out of nowhere saving you guys. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Well, the thing that was so funny about that is uh, in the movie where Penguin's got a submarine where he's got a special high-powered magnet on this buoy that attracts our, our utility belts, and we can't release the utility belt, and he starts shooting torpedoes at us, right? And Batman pulls out his, he's got a homing device that redirects the signals of the of the torpedoes that they miss us. And then the third torpedo is coming and he presses and he has this line. He says, oh my gosh, the batteries are dead, right? I mean, here for 25 cent battery, you're going to lose your life because you're battered, the batteries die. And and then you don't know what happens and we're flying in the bat copter and, and Adam has, Batman has this line. He's, that was a noble porpoise that swam in front of that torpedo to save our lives. I rewatched the movie because um, I just had you. I hadn't seen it in so long. But it's funny because Penguin Submarine. Right. The story in the movie is it's a pre-atomic submarine that he just bought from the government. <laughs> That's right. 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 Yeah. Oh, absolutely. A- yeah, absolutely. And then they shoot a, a Polaris missile. And it brings down the bat copter, and, it, and you think we're dead. We have to land on an outdoor display of rubber for sale. There's a giant pile of rubber that <laughs> we, we supposedly fell in, and, and you know when the, when the bat copter crashed, that saved our lives. Oh, there's some very funny, really funny stuff. Funny stuff. Yeah. There's, there's a scene where you're figuring out. Oh, here, you remember any of these? What does a turkey do when he flies upside down? He gobbles up. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what weighs six ounces, sits in a tree, and is very dangerous? A sparrow with a machine gun. Yes, of course. Oh, yeah. No, but I also had some tongue twisters. I had. Let me tell you something. I had a tongue twister where I had to say this. And, of course, Robin has to say it fast. It's not like being able to say something like even as we're talking relatively slowly. I had to say things very fast. I had one line that was, haven't you some anti-ballistic bat flax in your utility belt, Batman? You try to say that. That is really... You know, a tongue twister and everything I did had to be fast. And of course, the faster I was, the slower Adam was. He was such a character and such a funny, funny guy, unpredictable, fun loving, you know, always a twinkle in his eye. You know what I mean? I miss him terribly, but he he was a great and we had a very special friendship on the Batman. Even afterwards, when we did the two movies for Warner Brothers, they had two animated features released about, I guess, five or six years ago, one year after another one. I remember I was recording at at the recording studio, Warner Brothers. They had recorded us separately, and he came in to start his recording as I was finishing mine. And it was like my wife, Tracy, told me, said, you know, he he said, when Adam saw you, like, had a tear in his eye. And, you know, like, we kind of hugged. I mean, you got to understand, we worked together for over 50 years. There was a true friendship there, you know? We had times on the set where we would laugh, and sometimes even on the weekends, if we had time, we'd go out and play tennis. I mean, it was a true friendship and a mutual respect. It's heartwarming to hear that. It was a tragic loss. It was so sad when he passed away unexpectedly, right? I mean, it wasn't. Oh, yeah. And and the, the thing is, at the city hall, they had this amazing thing. The mayor arranged to have the bat signal projected on the L.A. City Hall, which is like, it's got kind of like what you would imagine Gotham City City Hall would look like. They project, and it was fantastic. And what a trip. And with less than, I think, three days notice, they had more than 12,000 people that showed They couldn't get any more people across from where, you know, the, on the lawn and everything to watch the memorial dedication that the mayor did and chief of police. And then I, I spoke and it was, it was really, it was a nice memorial to him. I'd say anytime like I'm kind of stuck on something, I always think back to a line of his from the Batman movie. It just cracks me up. Some days you just can't get rid of a bomb. Oh, yeah. He had this where he was going to throw the bomb off the pier. and There was a mother duck with some of her ducklings. And and then he was going to throw it in one direction. All of a sudden, here came the Salvation Army marching band. And it, it was very, it was so far ahead of its time. It was so tongue in cheek, really. And I don't recall any feature films or TV shows that were tongue in cheek at that time. We used to say that we put on our tights to put on the world. <laughs> yeah, you did. Oh, I wanted to ask you about Madge Blake and Harriet. Very sweet lady. She actually passed away during the time of the series. I had a funny thing happen on the set <laughs> with her. There was a scene. I didn't know she got very nervous for the shots, you know, and I'm standing next to her. And during the scene, Adam as Bruce Wayne says something and I'm supposed to cross over to join him because we're going to, you know, we got a message. We got to go to the study 
because the commissioner's calling. So, when, you know, when Alfred the butler comes in and tells, whispers something to, you know, Bruce Wayne, Adam turns to me and says, well, Robin, we got to do so-and-so. And so I'm supposed to go with him, right? Well, I'm standing next to her, but I didn't realize how nervous she gets during the filming. Just before, I mean, we started the scene and she reaches over and she grabs my wrist. I, I mean, with a grip, like a steel. So then... And and I was supposed to cross over and I didn't cross over. They said, cut, Bert, why didn't you cross over? Well, you can't. She's such a sweet little lady. I couldn't say that she grabbed my wrist. I couldn't do. So I just took as as though, you know what I mean? I just took the punishment, the blame for goofing up when I really, I wouldn't have goofed up, but she hadn't got a hold of me. And I mean, in a grip, like you just wouldn't believe, like a vice. And so what I had to do is, and I had to stand next to her. So I I could see her, it's going to come again. So then I put my hands behind me. So she had nothing to grab onto so I could do that. I never forgot that. I mean, I was always took pride in not messing up a, sh- a shot, but I couldn't tell on her. She was such a sweet lady. Oh, my gosh. And she gets so nervous. And yet she was just great for the part. I mean, the casting I thought was amazing. Just absolutely amazing, the casting and the villains and Cesar Romero as the Joker. All these great actors that were on Batman. Let me tell you something. They loved it. And one of the reasons they loved it, Jeff, was because they could be as big as they wanted. When, when they were doing other movies and stuff, they had to stay in the character, right? They couldn't make it that big or whatever. But here on Batman, they're a villain. They're bigger than life. They can have the most villainous laugh or whatever they want to do. And they love that. They love the freedom to be as big as they wanted. And, uh, you know, with Frank Gorshin as the Riddler, he had the amazing Riddler laugh. Cesar Romero had the, the, the Joker laugh. All of the characters uh, and the villains got to make it as big as they wanted. And everybody loved it. Talk to me about King Tut, Victor. Victor Buono, amazing actor. Oh, and he had a voice and a style. And and they just let him go. What an amazing actor. Oh, my God. I mean, I honestly, I'm telling you, I was like the kid in the candy store watching these people. I mean, these were people that I had either watched on television, all these stars, or watched in a movie. And he was great as King Tut. He just was great. And it was just so convincing and so evil. And and yet then when he would bump his head and he'd go back to being the professor, he was so mild and meek. And, you know, I mean, another great actor, Vincent Price. When I was a kid, I remember seeing a movie he did called The Raven. And I was only like five years old. And that really scared me. That movie scared me so bad. So here when they said, you know, Vincent Price is coming on the set, you know, it's like for somebody that as a child, you were so affected by something. I had kind of like a butterfly in my stomach when he first came on the set. And I saw him like, oh, my God, that's really him. And yet I, when I finally had a chance to be introduced to him, just the nicest guy in the world. Such a great actor. Oh, I read your book, by the way. So, uh, Shelley Winter. <laughs> oh, my Shelley Winters. Oh, my gosh. She was uh, very hilarious. I'd been warned about her. They said, oh, she, she's going to come after you, Bert. I said, what are you talking about? Said, oh, no, she likes young guys. Oh, come on. You know, you know. And yet she was and she was very nice and she was very professional. She did have me the book to read. She said, oh, I have a book for you to read. And I said, oh, oh, OK, well, thank you very much. And she said, I'll bring it tomorrow. And she brought it the next day and handed me the book. And it says The Delights of Older Women. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny you had a uh, quite amazing life i i love all these stories there was another story i thought was pretty cool you in 1963 uh were a theater apprentice and worked with rob reiner who later was uh, made one of his first tv debuts on batman yeah he and i both got an opportunity to apprentice uh, in a playhouse summer summer stock playhouse one of the most famous summer stock off-Broadway playhouses in um, New Hope, Pennsylvania. It was, what an opportunity. When this is where, it was called Bucks County Playhouse. And what happened is big celebrities would come in and they would do plays for like two weeks. And every two weeks on a Friday night, we would have to tear down the set and nobody would get any sleep until Monday night putting up this next set because you had to get it all, everything torn down, everything rebuilt, the next, all the sets put up for the next star that was coming in. He was, cause he was big. He was like the stage manager. They, cause he's the only one that could take that huge rope and pull that curtain up and down, you know? <laughs> so they made him stage, made Rob stage manager. 
And it was very nice. And I, I had a great time there. It's a beautiful place. And as a young actor, I mean, I didn't get the chance to do any acting, but I built sets. I was in the painting and design. I went with the people making the costumes and learned how to sew in the costumes. And can I tell you, it's so enriching when you do some of these other things. You don't just do the thing, one thing alone. But you do a little of everything. I loved it. Great memories. That is awesome. And then I know you've been so uh, generous with your time, but I just I have one final question. Sure, anything. Will Teenage Bill of Rights and Autumn Love, <laughs> the songs you do with Frank Zappa, ever be released? Whether the public needs to know, Bert, the public. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know something? I wish I could control that. Well, you know, MGM Records, they had come to me and I said, no, no, you guys, thank you for this amazing offer, but I can't sing. Oh, no, no, you don't have to worry about that, Bert. We're going to take care of that. I said, well, how can you take it? No, no, no. We're going to get you this really talented guy that's going to work with you. And it turns out it's Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. And let me tell you, his band, you have to just, you know what they look like? Oh, my gosh. The shaggy hair, the long beards. And they would come out in his band and they would just not only play and, and they were very talented, but then they would tear up their equipment. They destroy everything on the on, on the stage. They, they ruin their instruments. I, I, I just couldn't believe it. And Frank Zappa, let me tell you, what a brilliant guy. He had gone to Columbia uh, University and uh, was a, a music major. Brilliant. And yet when you look at him, you think like, oh, my goodness, this is a, straight out of Hate ashbury you know? I mean, this is, a, <laughs> I don't know about this guy. And he's such a nice guy, so brilliant. So what we did is we did one song, uh, Boy Wonder I Love You where I took and I I wrote the well I took the 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 text from a whole bunch of of fan letters and I put them together okay into a funny kind of a fan letter and then he arranged the and I don't know who created the music but that was boy wonder I love you and then there was another one orange colored sky there was a couple of things and I said I can't sing oh don't you worry you don't have to and he sort of played upon the fact that I wasn't a singer and just made it that much crazier so yeah, I wish I had control of it, but that was MGM Records. And now MGM, a number of years ago, was sold off to where it's partially owned by Sony, it's partially owned by Amazon. I, I don't know what's going to, if that those will ever come out. I think it would be great to have it come out, but I have no control. I was talking to um, Angela Cartwright, Lost in Space. I was talking to yeah. Butch Patrick from The Monsters. And the one thing that they both say is, yeah, Batman came on and then we got canceled. <laughs> oh, I don't know that we, we I don't know that we were even on the same network as them. But, you know, because there were so many shows being shot at Fox, we couldn't even shoot at 20th Century Fox. We were shooting at Desi Lou Culver Studios, the old Desi Lucy Studios in uh, Culver City, not in the main West L.A. Because at that time there was Lost in Space. There was also Peyton Place. I mean, there was a lot of Ryan O'Neill and there's a lot of shows they had on there. And I had my picture taken with the Lost in Space, the actors and everything there. Everybody was very nice. I, I don't really think because I don't think any of our shows really were competitive with others. But there were so many shows on at that time. I think it was some of it was the huge, colorful nature of your show, because remember, Lost in Space was a black and white drama. And then yeah, they literally true. changed their entire show. Yeah, that's right. And then Munsters was black and white. That's true. Yeah, so. And also Peyton Place, I think. Yeah. Yeah, but well, that's why Batman was like one of the first to be colorful. And boy, did they did they go all out, Jeff. They, that show was so amazingly colorful. And, and you know, everybody to have their two cents, even the crew, when we, they shot the villain's hideouts, they always shot it at an angle. And I finally ran into to one of the cinematographers after the series and said, I don't, what, why did you guys do that? What, what do you mean, Bert? Why did you always shoot the, the villain's hideout at an angle? I mean, you guys are among the best in the world. You can keep the camera straight. Well, we did that on purpose. What do you mean? Why did you, what do you mean? What did you, why did you turn the camera on an angle? He says, because the villains were crooked. So we made a crooked angle on the camera. I said, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Everybody had to have their two cents in. And it was hilarious because you'd always had a, a sign, villain's hideout or something. You know, I mean, right, right, you know, right, right, right. all of these things that, and and it just makes people laugh. That one of the first lines they put in the Batman opening show to make sure that people understood that this was a put on is when Batman went into this whiskey a go go, you know, which is uh, 
uh, or what a way to go go, which was there's a famous whiskey a go go in, in LA. So they made a joke of it, but where he goes in and then the maitre d' says, oh, can I get you a ringside seat? Bad. He's no, no, I'll stand at the bar. I shouldn't wish to attract attention. Right. <laughs> Here he is. right. Oh, my gosh. That, and he did it so well. Adam did it so well. It was terrific. And people really got it then. And once they understood that there was multiple levels, everybody, everybody came away with something that they were entertained by. It was amazing. And it's still super fun to watch even today. I think uh, anytime I see a clip or I see the meme of, of you and uh, Adam from the movie, you know, where you're running, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And you know something? I've actually seen episodes. I mean, not the whole episode, but I've seen scenes in watching some of the episodes that I had never even seen in all these years. Even though I have the, the DVD set, I didn't have, have a chance to watch all of them. And, and there are scenes in there that I did. I said, oh, my gosh, did I do that scene? And it's it's just uh, great memories. It is such a, a great memory. And the people that they treasure. I, let me tell you, I, I told you about the appearances. I make these appearances and people will come up with like things that they have saved for 50 years. Like this one guy came up with this lunchbox. It looked like an elephant had stepped on it. I mean, this Batman lunchbox, it survived. 50 years and he wanted me to sign this lunchbox you know what i mean and it's like hardly anything left it was like a squashed tin can type of thing and yet that was his his lunchbox when he was watching batman growing up they love those treasured things to be signed i love that i love it bert you're incredible i appreciate you spending yet another time with me uh and hanging out and sharing even more stories i love every second of it thank you so much well, thank you, Citizen. A special wish to all your listeners and viewers and best wishes for a successful future in this world that is very increasingly difficult. I wish everybody all the very best. Thank you, Bert. Can I get a holy chutzpah? <laughs> holy chutzpah, Batman! <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> 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 all right. How amazing was Bert Ward? So amazing. Am I right? So fun to talk Batman with Robin. Oh my gosh. Can't believe it. Pinching myself. 250 episodes and a second go around with Burt Ward. All oh, my podcast dreams are coming true. Definitely check out Gentle Giants Dog Food and Products. Seriously, love it. My dog Lola loves it. That part of Burt's life I find so fascinating. The Batman stuff, also awesome. I want to dedicate this episode to the memory of my good friend, Dan Lippett, who did slip me one of the questions that I asked Bert. Can't believe the episode's over. I can't believe it's been 250 episodes. Wow. Huge thanks to Bert Ward for coming back again and hanging out with me. And of course, special thanks to all of you for coming back week after week. It means the world to me. And I'll see you next time. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Classic Conversations. If you like what you heard, don't be shy and give us a follow on your favorite podcast app. Also, why not go ahead and tell all your friends about the show? You strike us as the kind of person that people listen to. Thanks in advance for spreading the word, and we'll catch you next time on Classic Conversations.